Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, do you all hear me okay? Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, today we're going to take a bit of a whistle-stop tour of areas of food science and dairy science that interest me um, as an organic chemist. So we'll be looking at, at food science through the eyes of an organic chemist, and, and what this means is that I'm interested in, in, in molecules and the structure of those molecules and how they react together, the interplay and what this means for food systems. And if we can understand this interaction, if we can control it, perhaps we can do some useful things in the context of, of dairy, but also other foods. So, um, so my world is basically this, pretty much the same world as, as Walter White's. It's the world of an organic chemist. And there are some differences, admittedly. Um, but uh, basically, if we look at organic chemistry, organic chemistry is a broad subject, but, but Roughly speaking, it's the study of carbon-based molecules. And so this is broad. I mean, in food, we have fats, proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, and all these are carbon-based. Um, and of course, this is interesting. Now, aside from the, the main components of food, the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates, we have other small molecules, which are undoubtedly organic and have well, exhibit interesting reactivities. So we have EGCG, which is the main polyphenol from green tea, and many KU researchers have looked at this. And what we see here is we have an antioxidant portion here that exhibits excellent antioxidant properties. And on this side of the molecule, we have this rather electron-rich ring that behaves as a nucleophile. And both these reactivities are quite interesting in the context of food. Beyond that, we have glycerin, a rather complex molecule with almost a steroid-like backbone and some glycosylated units down here in the southwest, and this is responsible for the taste of licorice. We have rubaudicide A, and this is the major component of, um, of these that we call steviol glycosides from the stevia plant. It's a sweetener. Intensely sweet, also a rather complicated structure, an A-glycone a core with, uh, again, saccharide units in the north and the south. Um, and then finally, we have sphingomyelin, which is a type of phospholipid, and we find these, among other places, in the milk fat globule membrane. And what's interesting here is we have a little extra reactivity here in the form of this amide bond, which can, can act as a hydrogen donor and acceptor. And this allows it to interact very strongly with, for example, cholesterol in, in lipid bilayers, providing rigidity. And we call these lipid rafts, and we find these in the milk fat globule membrane. So, when I ask myself about research and research projects, what I often wonder is, well, which, which molecules are present and, and in which amounts? Um, what kind of reactivity do they have? And, and, and can I learn to control this reactivity? Can I use it? And then, of course, because we are looking in an applied context, we're looking in food, I have to ask myself, to which processing conditions is the food subject? And then which, which chemical reactions occur during processing? And what does that mean for our food? And then how can I measure and characterize the outcomes of, of these reactions? So, obviously, the reactions that go on in food are, are many and varied. And we can, we can have a look at some of these now. This is clearly not a dairy reaction, but I thought it was quite interesting. So, in, in meat, we have a protein called myoglobin, which in this form, oxymyoglobin, where iron in the heme portion is in its 2 plus oxidation state, well, this is very much responsible for the red color we associate with fresh meat. Upon oxidation from iron 2 to iron 3, we get metmyoglobin, and the meat associated with this protein is, is more of a brown color, which means we have some kind of problems here for consumer acceptance. Now, interestingly, some researchers found that using a polyphenol, so from a, olives, green tea, plant extracts in general, we found that this guy, who is a very, very potent antioxidant, was able to actually donate electrons to the metmyoglobin, therefore reducing it back to its iron-2 state, and at the same time becoming, becoming oxidized. Excellent. So we can potentially regenerate the red color associated with fresh meat in stored products. However, this isn't the end of the story, because this reaction will actually hop back again. So we have a redox cycle going on here. So eventually, the oxymyoglobin will become oxidized back to the metmyoglobin, and this guy will be, go back to its, uh, to its original reduced form here. 
So we have a problem. And again, understanding the reactivity of these things, these researchers found out that if they added a thiol, often in the form of cysteine, the amino acid, in the presence of tyrosinase, which is an enzyme that is ubiquitous in plants in nature, I think the one they used actually came from a mushroom, they're able to form species of this nature. Now this is quite interesting because here we have slightly changed the reactivity and we're still able to perform the, the, the reductive part of the cycle where we can actually reduce iron-3 in metamyoglobin to iron-2. We can potentially regenerate the red colour in the associated with fresh meat, but then the reverse stops. And we think this is because this portion here is actually pushing electron density in this ring, making it less willing to accept electrons and therefore be reduced again. So this is quite basic science, but I think it, under, it underscores how important it is. I think it underscores how important it is to, uh, to understand molecular activity and how we can change things, and then how that can benefit food systems. This is another example of the same kind of molecule here, except we're looking at this side the catechin ring. This is a, an extremely strong nucleophile, and this we, we see that the authors have actually trapped um, reactive aldehydes. And these reactive aldehydes can be, of course, Strecker aldehydes, which are endpoints in the Maillard reaction, which are associated with, with flavor um, in, well, an, an undesired flavor, actually, in UHT milk and beer. So if we can understand this chemistry and control it, there are implications for improving quality in ambiently stored products. Um, and there are indeed a couple of projects addressing this at, at KU. And one of the posters outside specifically addresses the use of polyphenols in UHT milk. So I think you should go and have a look at that. It'll tell you in more detail what I'm showing you here. Now, again with chemistry and with food products, context is everything. So, here is proteolysis. It's simply the hydrolysis of a peptide bond catalyzed by some kind of protease. Sometimes this is extremely desirable. If your proteolysis happens to be performed or catalyzed by rennet or chymosin, to give it its correct name, and if it occurs in alpha S1 casein, then this is the first stage in actually producing cheese. So a very desired product. However, if it's rather, if it's another type of protease, such as plasmin, and plasmin is, exists in, in raw milk, it's the, it's the major proteolytic enzyme in raw milk, it also is quite heat resilient, so we find this in, in, in pasteurized milk. Well, this will, this will actually hydrolyze beta casein quite severely at room temperature, resulting in bitter peptides and gelling of the milk. And this is a picture from Valentin Rao's studies where he looked into the chemistry of plasmin. And it shows quite nicely here how we've got some severe gelling due to the proteolytic activity of the enzyme and the lowering of the pH of the milk. And, uh, and I can tell you from my own experience that milk tasted pretty bitter. So context is important. Uh, oxidation is also something that's been studied an awful lot at KU over the years. Um, I think we've got it in the room, one of the best chemists regarding oxidation in food systems in Layfair at the front. Um, this particular reaction, so formation of a disulfide from free thiols, either by single electron processes or by thiol disulfide interchange, is important to understand and master in a variety of systems. And one system where this is important is, of course, in, in, in baking. And here we can see that uh, catalyzing and controlling these types of interactions during dough proofing is extremely important for the quality of the final dough. And as you can see here, we've catalyzed with two types of enzymes, SOX, which is sulfidryl oxidase, and GOX, which is glucose oxidase. As you can see here, compared to the uh, control, we have a much, much broader, stronger dough. And we think this is to, due to uh, an increased amount of these crosslinks in the protein system. And finally, the, probably one of the most studied reactions in, in food science, the Maillard reaction, um, on the face of it, if you take it stepwise, it's actually quite simple. What's going on? It's simply condensation of, of an N-terminal, and this can be attached to a protein or a protein fragment or a free amino acid with a reducing sugar. So the open form of a sugar, galactose or glucose, for example. We lose water to go to a shift base, and a couple of double bond shifts later, we're here at the Amadori compound. And this is when things start to get a little bit interesting, because if we continue to do these, pro these double bond shifts, we lose water, and then finally we hydrolyze this iminium species, followed by a final double bond shift. We come to these guys. These are called three deoxyzones. They're um, markers for the Maillard reaction. They're also extremely reactive. They can actually go back in and react with, with the original proteins, and they can continue and break down and form things like, I don't know what this little Google thing is up here for. Let's see if I can get rid of that. 
There we go. Um, so these deoxyzones can continue in the Maillard reaction, before, um, producing streckeraldehydes, reducing, uh, resulting in more protein modification, and even coloured compounds called melanoidins. So clearly, this has, again, depending on the context, this has undesirable outcomes for some food products. And one food product where we really don't want this to happen is in, is in milk. And it is an issue, particularly in, uh, in UHT milks that are stored at ambient temperature, and even more particularly in the context of lactose hydrolyzed systems. So when we make UHT milk, we're obviously giving it quite a lot of heat. So, so we deactivate plasmin, we have to deactivate the microbes that can cause spoilage, and we can store the milk at room temperature. And in lactose hydrolyzed milk, we're actually also adding an enzyme to um, basically catalyze the hydrolysis of lactose down to galactose and glucose. Now, galactose, which we then get, so 50% of the original lactose is, is converted into galactose. This is an extremely reactive reducing sugar and it will very, very willingly participate in the Maillard reaction. Another thing to think about is that when we are adding this enzyme to the UHT milk, we're actually adding the lactase enzyme after the heat treatment. So it's active during its entire shelf life. And any background proteolytic activity that is present in some lactase products will result in small amounts of proteolysis, thereby giving you more N-terminals and more fuel for the Maillard reaction. So we have a system that is rich in reducing sugars, and we have a system that is rich in N-terminals. And you combine that with ambient storage, and we have a system that is extremely um, Maillard active, you could say. So clearly, there are some quality issues here. And this was studied in great depth by uh, Therese Janssen at the University of Aarhus, and Therese is working as a postdoc here now with us. Illustrating this quite nicely are these two diagrams. So what we see on the left here is uh, 2-methylbutanol, and this is one of these streckeraldehydes that I mentioned previously. This is an endpoint, or one of the possible endpoints of the Maillard reaction. And as you can see, at ambient temperature in milk, they accumulate quite nicely during storage. The black dots here, this is just regular non-hydrolyzed milk. And what we also see is, uh, and this points towards proteolysis, is isoleucine, accumulating quite nicely in the lactose-free, and we don't see any accumulation at all in the, uh, the non-hydrolyzed. And again, this points towards this kind of thing going on. And um, the other interesting point is that this is actually the amino acid that reacts with the sugar component to give you this product. So this is the starting material. And you can see the two correlate very, very well. So clearly we need some strategies to take care of this if you want to make shipping lactose-free milk to China with long shelf lives a reality which is one thing that the Danish dairy industry would like to do. And there are some strategies. One strategy is, of course, optimised alternative processing. Steam infusion is a good way of reducing heat load in milks. But as we've seen before, it's not really the original processing temperature that the milk is subject to. It's more the storage temperature afterwards. It's really that that, that allows the Maillard reaction to proceed. We can look at pure enzymes. And that's interesting because if we can reduce the amount of these N-terminals from any side protease activity, then we've taken care of half of the reaction equation. Half of the starting material is, is, is not present in as great amounts as usual. And finally, functional ingredients. And we do have a couple of projects in KU looking at that. Again, I would encourage you to go and look at Marianne and Lemetch's uh, polyphenol poster outside. I'm lucky enough to be involved in this project too. And you can also go and look at the, uh, on the website here, and you'll learn a bit more about that project. And we're getting some quite interesting results coming out of this. And on to a new project. So this is one that we have just started. Um, it's, it's myself, uh, Mariana, at Food Chemistry. We are also collaborating strongly with, with Arla Foods on this one and uh, with the Biomedical Institute over at uh, Panem. So our hypothesis here is that it's a bit of a mouthful, this, 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 this title, but we call it image. And what we're wondering is, if we can change the relative amounts of monosaccharides in a dairy system, can we somehow um, mediate the Maillard chemistry. And we're wondering, when, how does this change functionality and quality of, of a dairy product? And are there even health implications or learnings that we can, we can take out of this? We know that processed dairy products contain considerably high AGE levels. AGEs are advanced glycation endpoints, the end reactions of the Maillard system. We know that they exist in higher amounts in, in processed dairy than in breast milk or in raw, raw bovine milk. And we know that in some vulnerable people, this could be a health issue. Perhaps not so much for healthier people, but, but in people who have leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, these kinds of things. Um, so the question we're asking ourselves is, can we modulate these reaction pathways by con enzymatic conversion of simple sugars into oligosaccharides, into chains? 
Now this is quite a complicated relationship. When we think about lactose and beta-galactosidase or lactases, this is what we normally think about. So this is what happens in your lactose-free milk. We're simply catalyzing, using the enzyme, hydrolysis to this bond. Now, if you give this enough heat, it'll do it by itself in the presence of water, but it takes a very long time. The enzyme will actually weaken this bond, allowing water to add across this bond. That's all we're doing, we're just adding water, and we end up with these two monosaccharides, and of course, here's galactose, that very, very reactive chap. Now, not all lactases are the same. Some lactases that come from other microbial sources are actually able to synthesize chains. And it's precisely the same reaction mechanism. We still have a weakening of this bond, but instead of the OH that adds coming from water, the OH comes from another molecule of lactose. And so we build up a chain. So all the galactose that normally is free here, free to react with proteins, is now incorporated in a chain. And we hypothesize that, well, here's a nice schematic to show it even in an even more simple manner. We actually hypothesize that all of this galactose that once upon a time was available to react in the Maillard reaction is now unavailable because it's built into an oligosaccharide. And so this is our project idea. We go from a situation where we are heating, or rather we are storing at ambient temperatures, and remember ambient when you're transporting milk through the Arabian Gulf doesn't necessarily mean 22 degrees. So we're having a system here that is extremely reactive towards the Maillard reaction, and we're transferring to a system that simply has less reducing sugars. And what we hypothesize is that we will see limited age formation during long-term um, ambient storage, whatever ambient means. It could be up to 50 degrees in some contexts. And this is our project team. Uh, Wei Zhang is a very talented young gentleman from China who's just started about two weeks ago, and he's already in the lab making some nice calibration curves. So I guess the message here is, um, is to watch this space. Uh, these are some of the people who we're collaborating with. Ali is being a great source of support for us at Arla with uh, a lot of in-kind and know-how. So um, come back in a year and I'll tell you how it's going. Um, this is a project I did at Arla, which I'm only going to show some results that we had in the public domain. So um, you'll probably have some questions uh, and there are gaps, but this is simply due to the nature of the work. Some of it is some of it is, 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 is classified, and I've shown what's, what's been published in a patent application. But I think it illustrates, again, the kind of cool stuff that's going on in industry, and again, how understanding molecular activity is important. So, controlling the generation of free thiol and sulfur volatiles in heated milk. There are different types of UHT treatments. Um, this is the classical plate exchange, at 145 degrees for a few seconds. We have the uh, steam injection, and finally we have the steam infusion, and these affect very, very different chemical pathways in the milk. As a function of heat load, here is pasteurized milk. So you can basically correlate the area under this curve to the amount of chemical damage that goes on in the milk. So obviously, pasteurization, not much goes on. Tastes nice, tastes fresh, but you've got to keep it in the fridge and it lasts about a week. The huge mountain here is, is this guy. So of course, it's stable on the shelf, lasts forever, but there's a lot of chemical damage. And this guy with a little pointy bit here is the steam injection. So here we have, because the nature of the, of the heat contact, we're injecting steam into the system, it's very sharp and very controlled. It's stable, and there are some off flavors, but it's not quite as much damage as we see in the, uh, in the indirect. Then steam infusion is slightly different and rather more complex. We can get a microbially silent product, but not enzymatically silent product. Um, I won't go into this too much today. Um, this fellow is beta-lactoglobulin, and what happens to him is very important in the context of UHT milk. Um, many things happen when you heat this fellow in milk. Two things that are important that happen. One is um, basically unfolding, and unfolding allows this, this buried thiol in here on cysteine 121 to um, become available, and it will react with other thiols and disulfides around it, and one of those is, is plasmin. So, when this unfolds, it can form a covalent disulfur bond with plasmin. And thereby, we can actually deactivate plasmin. And thereby, we won't get gelling and proteolysis in the milk stored at room temperature. So this is very, very useful. On the other hand, the same irreversible unfolding causes the, uh, the, the protein molecule to be more labile towards breakdown, such as via Maillard path pathways. And this leads to volatile thiols and sulfides which give off flavor, this kind of cabbagey, sulfury off flavor one, one associates with UHT milk. And when you first make the UHT milk, it's, it's, it's terrible tasting, it really is. Um, 
so we were interested in controlling this. And here's a little map. You can say a heat map. So over here we have fresh milk. Got to keep it in the fridge because the microbes are still, the spoilage microbes are still there and the uh, plasma activation doesn't happen, but it all tastes nice because there's no chemical changes. Uh, direct steam infusion will provide us with uh, a microbially silent product, but still plasmin active, so you've got to keep it in the fridge, but it lasts about a month and tastes pretty fresh. And then we progress here to situations where, yes, we do have both enzymatically and microbially silent products, so perfect with ambient storage, long-term shelf life, but there are flavour issues due to these kinds of chemical changes. And what we want is if we can actually do something about the chemical changes and the flavour that, um, that is derived from free thiols. Um, and our hypothesis was this, is that we wanted to use an enzyme system that is already existing in milk. Now, this is the lactoperoxidase system. It's basically milk's own defense system. Um, it's actually approved. Stimulation of the lactoperoxidase system is actually approved in countries where there is a, a limited cold chain. So they actually add to raw milk small amounts of thiocyanate and peroxide to stimulate this system and thereby keep spoilage pathogens at bay. And it will oxidize free thiols. Now, we didn't want to do this because this is only allowed in very certain contexts. We wanted to find something else, but using the same molecular pathway. Lactose oxidase is an enzyme that is produced by Novozymes. It's a carbohydrate oxidase and it's under investigation for several dairy, several dairy applications. It's pretty interesting. You can read a lot about it in these articles and patent applications. But how can that help us? This is how it can help us. We start with lactose and we give it some lactose oxidase and lactose oxidase brings a friend to the party. It brings flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is a redox shuttle. And this rather complicated looking molecule, when you bring the enzyme and the sugar and the, enzyme and the, uh, the, the redox sh shuttle together, this actually oxidizes lactose and so it becomes reduced. And the product of this is lactobionic acid. Um, then what happens is because something is oxidized, we need to regenerate the catalyst. So reduced fad goes back to oxidized fad. And because that is oxidized, something else has to be reduced. And what is reduced is oxygen. And oxygen gets reduced to peroxide, which is a substrate for the lactoperoxidase system. So if we can, in a very controlled manner, oxidize a tiny, tiny amount of lactose using this enzyme in a very controlled manner, we can generate peroxide that will immediately be used by the lactoperoxidase system which will immediately oxidize any thiols that are generated during the processing. So we tried that. Uh, this is not a great slide, I admit, but it basically shows what we did. We, we took a whole load of different types of heating treatments, uh, both lactose hydrolyzed systems and regular systems, and uh, we, we treated the milk very carefully for a very short space of time, very cold temperature, small amount of enzyme before heat, heat processing. And what we found out was that basically it worked. We, saw a huge reduction in free thiol in enzyme-treated milks, and we saw a concomitant reduction in thiol-related off-flavor in a trained sensory panel. So that was pretty interesting. We see both chemical change and an improvement in, uh, in sensory perception. And what was also interesting is we didn't see any other increase in off-flavors associated with uncontrolled oxidation. So we were able to steer the oxidation towards where we wanted it, towards making, getting rid of the free thiols. Um, and that was our results. And obviously there's a lot more, but I can't tell you about it. You can look at this in a patent. Um, and obviously there's more to investigate. Um, so if anyone would like to look at this, I think we could probably talk to um, Novozymes who sell the enzyme and, 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 and look at a few things. Um, finally, this is some very, very new results that just came out last week. Uh, I'd like to point to Ellen Sonerson here. Uh, she's the MSc student who did this project and she really started from scratch and jumped in with both feet and was very brave and produced some good results. We wanted to look at a new, um, new-ish beta-galactosidase from, from the Arctic, from these guys. This is an icate column, it's calcium carbonate, and they are in the sea outside of Greenland. It's an extremely alkaline environment and it's extremely cold. So the enzymes that grow in here are also active at very low temperatures. And we thought this was interesting because most of dairy processing goes on at cold temperatures. So we wanted to investigate the performance in milk we wanted to elucidate whether it would hydrolyze or make the oligosaccharides that I mentioned before. And we wanted to look at how it would behave with substrates than lactose. And today I'll address these first two points. We think it's a bit relevant for industry. Um, lactose freeze increasing segment. All the enzymes we use today are mesophilic. They are happiest at sort of 37 to 40 degrees. 
but most of the lactose hydrolysis in the dairy system takes place at 10 degrees. So the enzymes are kind of working at a temperature that's not really optimized for themselves. So we are thinking if we can isolate some enzymes that actually are quite happy at colder temperatures, then we'll get a more rapid reaction at 10 degrees. Shorter holding times in the dairy, and perhaps there are some financial benefits here, if we can maintain the quality of the milk. And also inactivation of enzymes. If we want to actually make GOS and we want to stop the enzymatic reaction, that's also important. That's easy to do when the, when the enzyme is from a cold environment. We might just need to use a lot less heat to, to inactivate it. You can read about this in a patent here from Ali and I. Um, so Eileen went over to Plen and she spoke to Peter Stugord, who isolated this enzyme from nature and she performed uh, some biochemistry and isolated the beta-galactosidase. We then had a look in some lactose solutions, and originally, as I said, we were looking for hydrolysis, but what we saw was quite interesting. We actually saw that, that, that in lactose uh, solutions, just in buffer, we used various uh, uh, percentages, but this one is just at 20%. We saw that well, now what we're looking at here is this is lactose on an HPLC trace, glucose, galactose, and oligosaccharides. And what we saw with time was that we saw actually a surprising amount of oligosaccharide formation versus hydrolysis. Now, just to give it a bit of context, we were looking at, we haven't quite finalized the results, so it's more of an indication. But the absolute best fine-tuned enzymes for making GOS get to about 40% yield. And this is one that's come straight out of the Arctic seas. So we think this is quite an interesting, interesting starting point. Happily, when we tried this in milk, we also saw that simply putting the enzyme into milk at much, much lower levels of lactose, of course, in milk it's about 4.9%, we still saw formation of the oligosaccharides. And just to com compare here, this is what you would normally see in a regular lactose hydrolyzed milk. Here you see you're simply getting hydrolysis, some residual lactose. Here is some hydrolysis, but also oligosaccharide formation. So what we've shown here is that um, an enzyme that comes from icate columns in, in the Arctic is actually very, very good at making oligosaccharides at low temperatures. And also, it's very easy to stop this reaction because it's heat sensitive. So, in terms of future work, there was a lot more to the MSC, but those are the results I'm going to show today. In terms of future work, we obviously need to have a look at the nature of the chemical binding in these galactose oligosaccharides. This is very important for their bifidogenic nature. These oligosaccharides are both, uh, they're, they're fiber. So it's dietary fiber, but they're also bifidogenic. They support the uh, healthy growth of the gut microbiota. And this is important for a number of reasons. But we need to really go in and characterize them. We also would like to see if we, they can use if this enzyme can use other acceptors such as FUCOs, and thereby we can make oligosaccharides that are rather more similar to oligosaccharides found in human breast milk. And this is interesting for infant formula applications. Obviously, there is still a potential for faster hydrolysis, but we may have to optimize the enzyme a little for that. And then we think immobilization is interesting because then we can have the enzyme bound to a, a stationary phase and the milk flows past the enzyme rather than the enzyme being in the milk, but we still get the same chemical outcome. And that's interesting for, for purification reasons. And that is the end of my presentation today. I'd like just to take a minute to show that, uh, well, some might say that, that I collaborate a lot with these people because I'm not that great of a scientist, but they'd be wrong. Um, I think it's actually strength in collaboration. And um, yeah, all these people have collaborated fantastically. They're, they're helping a lot with the research. And I'd just like to also say thank you to everyone in DMP because I've not even been here for a year yet. And they've been so welcoming and nice. And, um, and I hope you thought this was interesting in some way. So thank you for your time.